Welcome everyone to Blue Abroad with a special segment trying to dissect what the hell is going on in trade and free agency. We're calling it trading rules and I've brought in the big guns, my fellow bald-headed friend, Lake Dog. How are you doing? Fantastic, Pom. Very, very excited. This is a topic that we're both very passionate about um, across a lot of sports, but especially the AFL. So this should be fun. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to it because I think as well, everyone knows the rules, but the rules are quite nuanced, aren't they? So they haven't really been updated when you look at your NBA, your NFL, your NHL, the big, big leagues that have similar structures. Ours doesn't quite match up, does it? Well, it's it's confusing. Those other leagues, I mean, there are intricacies to them, but broad strokes, you understand the different ways a player can move in the AFL. It's really hard to follow, and you can go and open up the AFL rules and look through player movement rules. There's like, I'm not a lawyer, but they seem to be a lot of conflicting different statements in there. It's very confusing. So we're going to try and clear that up and offer some uh, alternative approaches, I think, Pom. Yeah, well, we've got three different amendments each, so we'll get through them. But let's discuss So the current rules at the moment for anyone following. It's quite straightforward. Um, and we've taken this straight from the AFL rulebook. So um, in the AFL, a free agent is someone who is not in contract can move clubs freely. The AFL has three types of free agents. We've got the restricted free agency, the unrestricted free agency, and the delisted free agency. And um, as we know, the restricted free agency probably, I think, is the best rule in AFL. I, I, I think that is the most clearest, the most concise. I think it's the fairest. Um, what do you think about the restricted free agency? This is the official rule point. It's the top 25% earners of your club and they've played a minimum of eight years at the club. It's it's quite a fair rule, isn't it? It does what it says. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty clear. It's, you know, you've, you've hit either one of those goals. You're an unrestricted free agent. You can take an offer at another club and you can have that offer matched by your current club and either stay or have a trade uh, organized to have you move currently it's the one that makes the most sense to me uh, with some question marks but we'll go into them in more depth a bit later but broadly yes this one makes sense it does make sense and then we've got the unrestricted which i still think makes sense as well i mean the afl word it brilliantly it's basically the opposite of the above so um which is you'll find a common theme when the AFL explain rules. It's the opposite of what we've just said. But, I mean, this one as well is probably one of the more common ones that we see, isn't it, the unrestricted? You see these quite a bit. It's it, it's kind of a nothing rule. It's kind of, yeah, you, you're going if you want to and there's nothing we can do to stop you. Yeah, it's basically you've been around a long time. It's about time we should let you move without uh, any, comp well, <laughs> in theory, without any compensation. But of course, the AFL does have compensation. In other leagues, unrestricted free agent literally means that. It means you can move without restrictions. Um, in the AFL, you can do that, but it doesn't often happen. We can look at Robbie Tarrant. For instance, he was an unrestricted free agent this year, but ended up getting traded to Richmond rather than moving as a free agent because it would have affected compensation and made life hard for the clubs. So uh, there are some confusions, but in theory, you, you should just be able to move to wherever you want to go. And then we've got like the caveat rule. So we've got the delisted free agent who has been cut by the club. He's not subject to rules such as length of stake and walk once he's been offered a contract. Um, you've got players as well, remember as well, that are kind of contracted free agents like your Hewitts, like your Chairers more recently as well, which there isn't an official AFL rule. There's kind of a, a gentleman's agreement that if he's a good player, we'll trade for you because we're nice people. And that's what we're trying to dissect today. We think that for these delisted free agents, like, you know, you mentioned the unrestricted as well with Robbie Talent, we kind of want to clarify where we are as the AFL and kind of update these rules. So I think the best place to start is probably the draft. And you've got a really interesting one. Currently, for those watching at home, it's a two-year deal, generally, is the AFL. And there's kind of no real rules around you doing anything else, really. You can't 
some people do sign them for two years and then make a new contract very quickly. But there isn't much option to AFL clubs, is there really, in retention? It's kind of like a, a lottery, isn't it, really, that you're going to draft a player. We know interstate, it's the common thing, isn't it? A Victorian goes to Queensland and in two years he's back in Victoria. So what was the draft rule that you've amended? Because I actually think this is one of the more exciting rules. Yeah, well, I, I think it's exciting. And just touching on what you've touched on, basically the, the goal here is to get rid of that uncontracted player status. And the way that I've proposed that the AFL should move towards doing that is as follows. Draftees in the national draft receive a minimum of a three-year, or receive a three-year deal. No matter where you're drafted in the national draft, you get a three-year deal, which the AFL actually is discussing in real life about moving towards. But here's the caveat I've added. Clubs can choose to offer an additional three years on top of those locked in three years to first round selections, an additional two years to second round selections. So a total of five years for the second round and an additional one year to anyone taking in, taken in the third round onwards. So a total of four years. The rookie doesn't have to accept those offers. They can just take the three year deal. But the reasoning for it is, is this, let's say, North Melbourne take um, Horn Francis, Francis Horn, Horn Francis, whatever his name is, with pick number one in this year's draft and lock him in for three years at $200,000 a year. He's locked in for 600K over three years. In my proposal, they would then be able to go to him uh, after the draft day and before the start of the season say, as a part of this, we're offering you a, an additional three year deal at $600,000 a year. So we're taking what you've earned in your first three years and, and making that your annual salary for an additional three years. What this does is lock the player in for six years. They'd be 24 when they came out of contract and under my system would become an unrestricted free agent. This gives the first round pick financial security long-term. It gives the clubs security long-term in that they've signed this really highly talented player and there's no real risk now of him leaving. If he's accepted this, the additional three years, We've got him for six years. We can build around him. We don't have to make other plans in case he gets homesick and wants to leave. We've got him locked in and he's got his money. So the risk for the clubs is that maybe he's a dud. Maybe he is a dud and they've locked him in for six years. That's the risk they take and they've got to back in their scouting and developing. And the risk for the player is, well, what if I'm way better than the 600K they're offering me after my third year? Should I, should I take the money? And what if I'm a spud and, and I don't take the money and it's gone? So risk reward for both parties. And then you look at what I've proposed for the third round onwards, which is a single year extension uh, after signing. And the reason for that is if you find a gem, an absolute gem of a player in the fourth or the fifth round and they're an absolute jet, odds are their annual salary is going to be way lower than peak one. So you're giving them an opportunity if they exceed draft expectations to get their money, uh, make the most of their career and, and get out into the market, the restricted free agency market, and and make the money that they might not get. So if they exceed expectations, they get a chance to get their money and the clubs aren't locked into signing, you know, they're not being threatened by a, a fourth round pick that they have to sign into six years. So I think it's a win-win for both. I hope I've explained it well for you, Pong, because I'm no, really, no, no, really happy no. with this. No, I love that rule because I think that, like you say, what we're trying to do is promote onus for youth. I think a lot of people, when they talk about amending the rules, think, oh, my God, we're going to get an EPL-type situation where the best clubs are getting the best talent. I, I think it works the other way because when you look at the EPL, you're using a mandatory factor, you're using money, right? Mm -hmm. AFL doesn't have money. Everyone has the same salary cap, so effectively everyone's got the same transfer budget. Everyone gets draft picks in the national draft via their ladder position. Again, it's kind of like a communist type model, isn't it? That everyone, no yeah. matter how good you are, everyone's getting a bite of the pie based on where they are today. So I like it because I think that that puts a bit of onus in your scouting, puts a bit of onus in trusting your youth system as well. If you get a Horn Francis and you're like, this kid could be the next big thing. This could be our franchise model player. Six-year deal straight away puts the other clubs off. And it also says to the other clubs, in two years' time, if you are a Port Adelaide and you come sniffing around, you know you're going to have to pay overs for this player. You're not going to be like, well, you know what? We just wait a year. He's out of contract. Yeah. 
And I, I agree with you. I think two years is a very short time when you look at Lacocious, you look at players of that ilk where clubs are sniffing around, Max King, Ben King, trying to reunite them. It's not a long time for a club to try and get some trade commodity, is it, to try and make a trade happen? So that extra third year with the additional benefits of extending it kind of put the other clubs who were sniffing around on the back burner, don't they? Well, it does. It gives the club screw because even after three years, let's say uh, we'll use Horn Francis, Francis Horn, as an example, uh, if in three years he did decide he still wanted to go home, well, Kangaroos already have him locked into an additional three years at 600k a year in the example I've used. That's good. To get him out of that club, you're going to have to pay so much if he really if he really wants to go. And under our model, he's restricted. So and he's under contract. So if North don't want to trade him, they don't have to. But if he's going to make a big sook and dance and, and you know, refuse to play and he's going to threaten to sit out and all that and really wants to leave, you do have him locked away for a long period of time at a high salary and you're going to get a massive return from him. I think the flow and effect, Pom, from this, which we've spoken about before offline, is that if if you put an onus on, on player retention at a young age and have heavily investing in those players before they come into the club, it's going to increase the necessity for scouting, increase the assets put into scouting, and then hopefully for us as fans at home, increase the product surrounding these young players and the hype around them so we get to watch them not just, you know, in the preseason before they play AFL, but, it, you know, through their whole juniors. And really what I would hope this does is trickle down and build interest in younger players and, under 18s footy so that we can actually follow these guys journey which i know you and me have spoken about a lot no no i'm 100 percent with you and um, my additional amendment to the draft is i'd like to see i know you said after it they become like an unrestricted free agent under your rules i'd like to see if have a model so currently we've got the compensation model which i think is one of the most peculiar um rules in the afl um, just to read out how the AFL does the compensation picks and how it bases it out, it's one of the more weirder things. It's basically the value of the new contract offered to the player with the age, and then from that formula, it's either a first rounder, end of first, beginning of the second, end of second, or somewhere in the third. And it literally says somewhere in the third. Um, the AFL's wording is very measured i'd like to see the compensation in all trades paid for by the buying party anyway i don't think the afl should be like your dad at monopoly and he just he's the banker <laughs> and he he happens to find the money for mayfair i think they should have a model so the model that i've proposed particularly for draft players is i think the draft play players are protected based on their pick so if you've played 50 games available in your first three years you are now under what's called a drafty protection program. So your, if you paid a first and they played over first, instantly it's a first on points less than 10%. So if you've paid 3,000 3, is pick one, if you've taken him pick one and he now wants to go and there's nothing you can, that first is protected based on the value to your club. So a first must be offered for that player. Now, if he doesn't fall under that, I suggest something like this, and that is the compensation, and this is not just for drafts for everyone, is redeveloped. So if you've averaged zero to 10 games, it must be a third val third rounder, a value of a third. So I would take ninth pick in the third as the points value. I like the points value for AFL. And the reason that we say a third is on average 61.8% of players play that amount of games in their first three years. 11 to 15 is a second rounder, and anything above 15 is a value of a first. And I think that that amendment there, one, protects the interstate clubs particularly, and the Victorian clubs taking interstaters with early picks. So a great example here would have been SPS, because SPS's value, they would have gone and they've seen, right, he's played quite a few games, that actually works out as a minimum of a second rounder on his protection if he'd happened in his first three years. So it gives Carlton a bit of value that this player hasn't worked out. He's now homesick. We're willing to play him, as been proven. He's playing around that 11-15 mark. 
there's a bit of value because you could argue, although SPS might not be best 22, he has been part of Carlton's build, so therefore has a value to the selling party. Yeah, look, I, I don't I don't mind it at all, Pom. And I think I think that having a rule around it would just help solidify the understanding and stop a lot of media speculation and stuff. So Adam Cher is another good example. He wants to come to the Blues. He's played whatever it is, 20 games a year for, for his career. Under your model, he's worth a first-round pick. Now, we all knew that we were going to send pick six for him, but there was calls for making it two first, blah, blah, blah. We all knew it was going to be a first-round pick for him, but having that actually written rather than just a handshake, we're all mates, you know, this is just the vibe sort of thing. Having it actually written down helps structure and helps fans understand valuations of players a lot better. And um, and having actual rules written down, weird enough, helps the AFL run things rather than just kind of vibing it like they currently do on whenever a decision seems to be passed down. Well, I think a great example is Maribor Chol because under this model, he would have been a third rounder, right? Yes. And that would have been paid for by Gold Coast. Now, Richmond somehow got a second rounder. No one's quite sure. But I, it would have done two things for me. Richmond, towards the back end of last year, would have been in a position where, you know what? We might have to play this guy because he wants to go. So we might have to play this guy to try and increase his value. It creates a game within a game. But yeah. also, Gold Coast, if they want him, are going to have to give a third. So they've got to ask themselves... Do we want it? The current model is brilliant for Richmond because they've sold a player that they don't really use and they've got a second from just the imaginary tree of trade picks where yeah. would Gold Coast have wanted him if they'd had to pay a second themselves? Would they have deemed that in their structure? Which then creates that other market of he may have just walked a free agency and other clubs may have been interested and it creates that issue of looking after your young players. Yeah, and evaluating them based on what they've actually done. Like if Richmond took Marbia Chol to the trade table and said, we want a second, I don't think they would have got a call back from a single club. But because it's coming from the AFL, they were happy to let him go. So it uh, that's a perplexing one, particularly as a, as a delisted free agent. The guy was delisted earlier in his career, which makes him an unrestricted free agent, and he still got a second-round pick when you couldn't get it at the trade table. I like what you've done, Pom. I like what you've done. I, I also think with that rule as well, the current model as well, if if Gold Coast just, say, said, look, Mario Ball was like, look, I don't want to move to Queensland. It's it's a hellhole. And they said, <laughs> well, you know what? Okay, we'll give you 800 for two years. That could have been a first. So that's what people think yeah, with that yeah. compensation. <laughs> yeah. He could have been like pick five all of a sudden yeah. out of nowhere. And you've got to ask yourself then, is that fair? Like you said it the other day, I thought you worded it brilliantly. With this rule, there's one winner in this case and 17 losers. So anyone who is behind Richmond now with that pick has lost out and they've had no involvement in this deal. They, they've yeah. just been sat there. Yeah. No, 100%. I think the current system is, uh, yes, just that. It creates a lot of losers and, and very few winners. I think Marbia Chol might be the biggest winner because of the pay packet he's getting, but uh, kudos to him. I'm glad he was able to get his money. That's what we're trying to do, get payers played. And I think what the most important part of this is, is creating opportunities for players. So you've got some really good rules. Just share with us one of your opportunity rules that you think will really break out the... Uh, chances for players to actually sustain their career more importantly yeah so one of the things i've focused on in this proposal or this video is uh encouraging players to extend their career because the average AFL career is actually really really short i think it's like two years maybe maybe three so what i'm looking to do is give players an opportunity to extend their career but also um take some of the cloudiness out of that so what i would do in my perfect world there would be two statuses you'd be a restricted free agent or an unrestricted free agent. There is no out of contract player. Currently that's where all our issues come from because in the current system, POM, Adam Chera was uncontracted. He was owned by no club, but his only option other than getting traded is to nominate for a draft, even though he's already been in the league for whatever it was, three or four years. Whereas in my system, as I'm about to go through, he would qualify as a restricted free agent. So here's my proposal. At the end of your first deal, 
you become a restricted free agent unless that deal exceeds your sixth season. So basically, after sixth season, you become unrestricted. Before that, you're restricted. Um, restricted free agency in my system means this. If you're offered a deal by another club, your current club has the rights to match it and pay up to 25% extra in salary outside of the salary cap. This is an attempt to give clubs an opportunity to retain players and uh, have players remain loyal without crushing their salary cap. So matching an offer, uh, we want to offer Sam Walsh a million dollars a year. Carlton goes, great, we will match that. Sam, we're paying you 250 grand a year outside the salary cap uh, over four years. That's an extra million dollars in your pocket. It encourages a, a long-term deal for Sam Walsh. It encourages his club to retain him. If the player still wants to leave, after a deal is matched. This is what I've suggested, but I like your compensation stuff as well. I would simply just say, if a deal has been matched by a club and the player still leaves, you get an end of third round compensation pick. Because we've fallen into this idea that compensation should be fair. And it's similar to what you said about the, the you know, we're all a bit of a communistic community in the AFL. There's this idea that if your player leaves, you should get fair compensation because you are unable to hold them. I don't agree with that. But giving an end of third round pick gives you an asset to physically bring in another player to fill the hole of a list spot, which you might not have had. So players restricted, if the offer's not matched, if, the, if um, Geelong come to Sam Walsh and say, we're going to pay you a million dollars a year, and Carton say, no, Sam, we can't afford to keep you. We're choosing not to match. You don't get any compensation. The player moves for free. That's it. That's the end of it. If the player's... Uh, class as an unrestricted free agent, which in my system is they've had at least six years in the AFL, they can just move wherever they want. And this is what I wanted to talk to you about, Pom. This one's a little confusing, but I would like to have some sort of incentive to see players from top level clubs come down to bottom level clubs as unrestricted free agents when they're in their prime. The way I say we should do this or could do this would be you take the ladder at the end of the year, we we'll use Jordan Dawson as an example here. Take the ladder at the end of the year. If you're moving from club one to club 18, club 18 can pay, let's say they offer you a million dollars. They can offer 17% extra on top of that, but outside the salary cap. 1% for every ladder position difference. For Jordan Dawson's case, he wants to get home to South Australia. Port Adelaide are top, finished top of the ladder um, in, the, in the normal season and Adelaide uh, finished below Sydney. They both offer him a million dollars. He can't choose which one he wants to go to. Port, he's going to get more success, but maybe gets more opportunity at, at Adelaide. Adelaide said, right, well, we finished six positions below, um, below Sydney. We'll offer you an extra 6% per year outside of the salary cap on top of the million dollars. And that ends up, you know, coming out at, a couple hundred grand over the life of the deal. So basically it gives lower level clubs incentive to bring in high level talent from top level clubs. It gives them the players financial incentive to move from a top level club to a bottom level club. And it doesn't crush the salary cap of those bottom level clubs, which historically haven't been great at managing their cap. So they're my two proposals, matching players who are restricted at being able to pay outside the salary cap to keep them. And then on the inverse, being able to pay players outside the salary cap to attract them to the club if the club is a lower level club than the top level club. Hopefully I've explained that to you very well. It's crystal clear to me and I, I like it because I think that my, my amendment is kind of based on that because I looked at Stephen May and Tom Lynch Yep. A Gold Coast. I look at Gold Coast list and I think they don't have established talent yet. They've just, the kind of the last five years been in a perpetual cycle of young kids and average footballers. Yep. And every time one of these young kids becomes potential to be elite, Tom Lynch, Stephen May, they have to get rid of him. So I like that because that's going to encourage player movement of maybe say, let's use an example, John Dawson is a great example, I think, because he's got the potential probably to be really elite and he's probably the next cab off the rank for Sydney, the guy who's going to jump. Well, he's yeah. got the chance then to go to Gold Coast or Adelaide and be their star and basically 
go for the right reasons, you know, of I can bring success here and I'm going to choose the weaker team because I'm going to get paid the elite salary, which hopefully then will make him the elite player. And on that rule, I like after six years, I the club that retains that contract can create a franchise situation. So I suggest every club on the AFL has two franchise players and they're nominated for the duration of that contract. So it's just that contract. If you sign a four-year deal for four years, that player is deemed a franchise player unless you trade him out. So you can't delist him. If you delist him, that's on you. That, that yeah. stays there for four years as one burn. But if you trade him, there's the exception. But it is a player outside of the salary cap. So his whole salary in that contract will be there. Now, the reason I like this is because, say, a Stephen May, he went to Melbourne. Gold Coast could have been in a position to say, look, we'll pay you 1.5. We'll pay you yeah. 1.5 million. Please stay. We, we're going to build a team. Look at the young draftees we've got coming through. Lacocious, Rankine, Anderson, Rauer coming through the draft in the next couple of years. Please stay. We want you to be the captain. We want you to be there. Now, would that change the mind of some of these players that they're going to get sustained, long-term, guaranteed contracts? And knowing then as well, Gold Coast could pay Raul 800k to keep him under your model for six years. So Raul could have come through and they said, look, here's 200 for three years. On year three, we're going to pay you 800 because we've got May off the books. He doesn't count. It gives yeah. them more money to spend on their youth, which is what I'm trying to do here, create opportunities for draftees. I want to see, ideally, we get 100% one club ownership in a, in a final Every player on that list, it playing, is 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 that player's draft? They've drafted him. I think that's yeah. the dream model. I, I I think so too. Look, I I love player movement, and I want to empower players to move. But my ultimate goal is 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 for clubs to be able to retain their players and do it without. Uh, will do it outside their salary cap so that it doesn't prevent them from bringing in other players if they want. But it also doesn't prevent them from rewarding all of the players that are developing. One of the potential risks is when you do a rebuild and you draft six first rounders in two years or whatever, and let's say they all turn into superstars, you don't want to be having them squeezed out because you can't afford to pay them. Having your franchise model allows you to protect a couple of those players and pay the others. I'll say this, Pomp. The only worry I have with all of our of all of our rules so far is that because clubs aren't privately owned, whether there is enough money within those clubs to pay outside the salary cap, I would hope there is. I would assume there is, but I'm just flagging that as maybe uh, St Kilda don't have any money outside of everything they're already putting into their to their salary. But just flagging that. Yeah, I mean, and I think that also brings us on to the should reveal this. I, I would love to see financials released at the end of the year. Now, you don't have to say Patrick Cripps is being paid 950k a year or Adam Chera is on 625k a year. You could quite easily just say our total payments for the season just gone were base salary X amount of million dollars. And Leave it to conjecture because I think that brings us into a realm where already you get people saying, how do Cowton afford this? Aren't they paying Cripper five million a year, which I've seen on an Essendon page, which made me giggle. Isn't Charlie Kerno on four million a year? And I'm like, what? But I think it takes that out, but it also creates a good indication of how clubs are running their financial structure. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a really important thing. I think more transparency transparency is better. We'll never know the individual contracts of players. They're never going to sign off on that. If if I was, and I don't understand the entire economics of the league, but what I would do is offer the players a higher share uh, of the total revenue in exchange for that, making that public, if I was running the AFL, but I don't think that'll ever happen. So having broad strokes numbers and just knowing where the clubs are at, I think is it would be really helpful for us fans at home and help us understand you know, oh, we only spent 12 of our $13 million. Okay, it makes sense that we bought in two big-name players this year in the off-season and everything's honky-dory. While we're talking about financial structure, Pom, I would like to amend slightly the way that clubs can construct uh, con uh, contracts with players 
at the moment it's a bit Mickey Mouse. It's, they seem to change and chop and change him every year. But my, my biggest gripe is the way they back, back end deals. So Peter Laddams, for example, let's say he had signed a four-year deal with, with Port Adelaide. I can't remember exactly how many years his last year was, but let's say it was Port Adelaide. In those first three years, which was 75% of the length of the deal, he got paid 25% of the total salary reported. So meaning in the final 25% in terms of time of the contract, the final year, he's owed 75% of his salary and they all of a sudden don't want to pay him that much money for one year and they're trying to force him out and get a, an asset in return. So this is a pretty simple one. I would propose a maximum 10% 10, 10 increase or decrease year on year in a deal, meaning if you made, if you signed a $4 million deal over four years, you couldn't go like 100 grand, 100 grand, 100 grand, 2.7 mil or whatever the maths is that I can't do off the top of my head. It'd, you'd have to essentially be flat contracts, some slight variance for, uh, for flexibility for clubs, but ultimately I don't want my player getting 75% of his salary in one year and being forced out. So just flattening that and making it much simpler, I think is a really good thing for the players as well, because they don't want to, it's, it's not much as I'd love to write home and say, Hey mom, I'm getting a million dollars this year and a hundred grand next year. Um, I don't want to be getting forced out because of that from my club that I love. I just want a flat structure. So yeah, cap the increases and decreases year and year in salary. So we don't have situations where clubs are forcing players out. Um, or well, for I mean, the deals that the club signed. Well, I mean, the NBA, they structure that quite well, don't they? Because yeah. there is a limitation on that. Also, I know the MLS has a limitation on the contracts as well of how they're structured in deals that are escalating. You can't just, like you say, say, look, Dow, I'll give you 200K this year, 200K next year, 1.6 million the year after. That's 2 million over four years. Fantastic. And then we trade him in the fourth year, so we save money. Yeah. I, I think it's either do that or have a penalty if you do that and say, well, tell you what, 50% of his remaining salary is coming off your books for this year. You can't, just because you've traded him, yeah. because you've duped that player into signing a deal. In my opinion, it is a manipulation of your cap. If Because you're telling me Port didn't know they were going to do that. Like, surely yeah. if you're managing your business well... You know, in the fourth year, you could afford that no matter what happens. So my current understanding, and you're absolutely right, Pom, is that when someone signs a deal in the AFL, it goes to the AFL, they check it against the total player payments, but they don't they don't consider the cap. They just look at the deal, they go, right, they can afford this and sign it off. The only time the AFL seems to actually, from what I can tell from reading the AFL rules, check the total player payments is at the, like, the end of the season, October 31st. They get sent the Excel doc or whatever, and everything has to work out. So there is a period of time in in a, in a season where the clubs are actually over the salary cap. We saw it last year after Brody Grundy got signed by Collingwood, and that's why they had to force out three players because when the deal was signed, everything was honky-dory. Last year, when the AFL signed off on the salary cap, it was great, and they were under the salary cap, and then it got to this year, and they signed all those deals in between, and all of a sudden they were going to be over the salary cap. So they had to force out players. And what you're suggesting with a penalty is actually is actually a really good idea because once again, there kind of is an unwritten rule about that where Collingwood force out Adam Trelaw to Western Bulldogs and then pay him five hundred grand, pay five hundred grand a year of his salary for him to play in a premier in a grand final for another team. That's an unwritten rule that they come to that agreement, and they didn't come to that agreement till like two months after he was traded or a month after he's traded, which is insanity. The new football season had technically started. So or new year had started. So having it written as a rule just once again clears that up and everyone knows exactly what rules they're playing by and you'd then be able to work out the salary side of a trade during the trade period, not two months after when you're still arguing about who's going to pay what. No, no, spot on. I, I think it needs to be clear. It really does need to be clear. I think that clarity is good because I hate these gentleman agreements. I just think it makes, in my opinion, it makes the sport look second class. Because yeah. if you got me as a list manager, I wouldn't be doing people favours. So yeah. I would break the mould. I would break the mould. I wouldn't be bothered about being nice. I would be bothered about winning. And I'd get into the mindset of winning every deal because that's my job. I'm a player. I should have the player mentality. 
of winning for my club. So I think if you stipulate the rules like this, makes it a lot more, I think, more challenging for clubs to operate. And that's what we want. We want freedom of movement, but we also want it to be, be hard. It should be hard. We shouldn't be able to go, oh, shit, like dog, we're a million over our salary cap. Oh, that's all right. What we'll do is we'll just pay everyone 100K and then tell them we'll pay 200, we'll pay 2 million year five and we'll push the problem back yeah. a bit. Yeah. We'll push it back. And then we'll, for laughs, we'll trade two people and not tell them. You know yeah, I mean? and, and, and start winning. spreading rumours about how they're the worst person to be around at the club and no one <laughs> likes them and, you know, start leaking stories about them. Yeah, that'll be great. And, and the other idea I had, and this is because a lot of these rules, I think, benefit the weaker sides because we're trying to encourage them to retain their players. I thought about player development, and I'll use the mid-season draft as an example. I look at the mid-season draft as the biggest waste of time in the world because I love state footballers coming in, but I draw a little bit of a, a bit of an issue when a mid-ager is coming in and at the expense of a kid. And I use someone like Marion Pickett as an example who's done wonderfully well and he's taken his advantage. But you can't tell me that, or Josh DeLuca for us, you can't tell me that Josh Honey couldn't have played Josh DeLuca's role and yeah. had them six games a bit earlier in his career. Or Cam Paulson at the time. I know it didn't work out, but you're telling me we had a small forward that wasn't doing much. You can't tell me there for the development. So I've brought in a loan buyback rule, which comes from straight from the EPL. So I'd love to see an option for teams to loan players. So I'll use an example. Last year, Gold Coast, Anyone over 190 evidently got rickets at <laughs> Gold Coast. So I would look at teams like North Melbourne who have four or five Ruckman on their list. And a lot of them are young players like Campbell and Zeri and players like that. It would have been a great option for them to say, look, VFL's a bit crap at the moment. You need a guy. We'll loan you him and they pay the salary. So what I'm saying in that deal is, is it's a straight salary swap. They say, look, okay, we've got enough money on our books. We've injury listed Jared Witts. We'll take on his salary off your cap. And effectively, you see it in NBA, people trade salary concessions. I'm saying that. So for that favor, Melbourne say, next year for you doing this for us, we'll take 200K off your salary cap. We'll effectively add that to your kitty and have it deducted from ours because you're doing us a favour. We, we've got him. And it's a good chance for the AFL clubs, I think, then to see their kids playing in an elite system, an yeah. elite system first and foremost. Oh, particularly in the last couple of years, like we saw uh, as Blues fans, we saw Sam Ramsey delisted in the last uh, you know couple of weeks and we didn't get to see him play footy as effectively for his entire rookie contract because of COVID times and uncertainty and hopefully that's gone in the future but if we could have loaned him to I, I don't know I can't think of a team North Melbourne and they had played him through the guts and he'd won him a game or two geez you'd be looking at it a little differently it'd be a, a very interesting little um little experiment and I think it helps with your value as well. Let's just say Carlton had deemed Sam Ramsey wasn't very good. If he played five games for, say, North or Gold Coast last year, showed a bit. Carlton may have been in a situation this year where there was a bit of trade bait. And they could say, well, look, he's not good enough for us, but he might be worth a fourth rounder. Do you know what I mean? At least you get something. Because at the moment in this system, there is thousands and thousands of players just going straight back into state football. And we just don't know. We, we just don't know if they're any good. Nick Graham's a great example. VFL was Gary Ablett Jr. In seniors, he was Gary Ablett Sr. now. So <laughs> it's not always a good measurement of being good. But then there's a lot of players, and I'll use Durden as this example. In VFL, he showed a bit, but I would say from watching him closely, in AFL, he's been a lot superior to his VFL form. He's, he's been a lot more impactful in games, which isn't kind of a correlation to his VFL form. So I, I agree with you. If Ramsey had gone, maybe them numbers would mean more in the AFL for us to sell.
Yeah, and there's actually this is an, another for for another video another time. But the fact that we played different rules in the VFL comp to the AFL comp um, makes it very hard to draw exact correlations between the two. But I think it would have been a great opportunity a few years back when, uh, say, Cam McCarthy he really wanted to go and play in Fremantle because he was homesick, didn't want to play at GWS. They said we're not trading you, and then he effectively wasn't allowed to to play. He went back home into the WA but wasn't allowed to play footy and kind of lost his touch and whatnot. If they could have loaned him to Fremantle for that year, and even if he didn't play senior footy, even if he played for their reserve side and Fremantle had paid a, a certain amount of his salary, you're getting him into the system, you know he's going to leave next year anyway, and he's not getting lost completely to the game. Now, obviously, he didn't turn out to be super impactful in the AFL, but there's there are some opportunities where a loan system is not just a, a tactical decision but a compassionate one because players are still human beings. No, 100%. And my final amendment was, and, and it's based on that, I'd like to see a buyback rule for some of these young players. Now, what I mean about that is someone like Callum Jones, who's left this year. Now, I'd like to see an ability for a player like that who's on the fringe or maybe not there to give the clubs an incentive to sell, but also an incentive for that buying team to effectively do a long-term loan that if he does take off, they're going to get a benefit. So as a Callum Jones' example, I would have liked to have seen them initiate a buyback and say, we'll give him for a fourth, but if he takes off in two years and it's a max of a two-year turnaround, we'll give you a second to buy him back. And it has to be a preordained deal. And I'd add that into the loans as well as a bit of a risk factor. So Cam McCarthy would be a great example We'll loan him, and in the first year, you've got to pay a third to buy him to make that deal permanent. And have the buyback there. So it enables the good clubs who maybe are established to retain some fringe talent, but also gives the lower clubs the chance to get top-end talent and maybe have an option of keeping him themselves at a cost price. Yeah, no, I, I really like it because essentially you're if you're a top-tier club, you're sending a fringe player who might might be really great. He's just not going to get into your best 22. You're sending him to play senior footy at a club that's struggling to fill holes. If he takes off, well, uh, A, he's rewarding the lower-level club by playing well for them, but then B, they get a pick back uh, better than they gave up for him as like a thank you for developing and giving him the opportunity and then there'd be systems in place, I'm sure, where they could try and bring him up permanently. Like, I think it's a, a really interesting system that would reward uh, clubs for developing other clubs' talent, basically. No, I love it. And I, I, that's, that's my idea as well. You know, reward talent, like reward that talent development. So effectively, you could use North Melbourne as a feeder team and say, right, okay, let's use Jack Carroll as an example. He's probably two years away from our midfield. But yep. let's throw him into North. North said they want to use him. We'll trade him fourth. We'll agree to pay a second back. Year one, he goes off. Carlton then could be in a position to think, right, we need him back. So let's sell Dow. It's going to make yeah. Carlton yeah. get rid of a player. Do you know what I mean? It's going to make Carlton say, well, he's ready for best 22. We don't want to lose him. So who can we get rid of here in our start in 22. And it encourages, I think, a, a conveyor belt of talent because I find what happens in the AFL now under this simple model is you get players like, say, Luke Hodge, Jordan Lewis, who kind of move clubs at the back end of their career yep. once a junior has finally shown it for three years in VFL. Under this model, I'm hoping to see maybe Luke Hodge leave at 31 when he's still yep. got for maybe four years left in the tank, and then Hawks take a chance on the kid. Because you see Hawthorne a case in point at the moment. Their list is old all of a sudden. Suddenly it has to go young, and you've got a major rebuild. What I'd like yes. to see, and I think both what we've done really well, is create a rule where it's always equal. No one's too old, no one's too young. If you use the system right, you should always eventually have 18 clubs that are about the same level. Yeah, no, I agree. I think I think a lot of what we've talked about, the focus is still maintaining the idea of equalisation in the AFL, but 
offering opportunities with a focus to the to the younger players because the older guys are going to get their money. The older guys are going to get their opportunities. Um, you use that example of Carol. Maybe it, if it was last year, Ed Kerno suddenly they like, oh, we really need Carol to come in and play. Ed, we know you've signed on for next year. We're actually going to send you uh, into a, a, a contending team. We're going to give you an opportunity to provide depth there, maybe win a premiership, and then we get to have Jack Carroll in our best 22 when we, we didn't actually know he was going to be in our best 22. Um, all this exposed form to actual senior footy under our current rules is a, is a really good thing. No, I love it. I love it. Well, these are our ideas. Let us know in the comments what your ideas are, things that you might agree with, any additional ones that we haven't thought of. We'll have a chat about it, and uh, we'll probably do a part two to discuss some of your best ones. I like it.